Thank you, Evie and Handbell Choir, for that beautiful rendition this morning. We want to welcome everybody and guests that are joining us uh, this morning, both those of you who are live and those of you who are online. We're especially glad to have you today on this special day. Uh, for those of you who are guests or first-time attenders, let me draw your attention to the card, uh, the deck in front of you where you have a card that you, if you'd be so kind to fill out, that we might have a record of your attendance, we would appreciate that greatly. In terms of announcements, uh, obviously today is the Annie Armstrong offering, and this is something that we do each and every year. Lives change as a re direct result of our support of North American missionaries. This year, our goal is $17,000, and we look forward to reaching that today. <clears throat> Uh, parents Night Out, September, uh, Saturday, April 13th. Our kids will have a Parents Night Out on that date uh, from 5.30 to 8.30. Kids will play games, eat pizza, and watch a movie together. So please RSVP if you're able to attend that. And then uh, Morning in the Gardens, Tuesday, April 23rd. Please make your plans to join us for a Morning in the Gardens. Meet at the church at 9.45 to carpool from the church or meet at Birmingham Botanical Gardens at 10 o'clock. We will receive a tour of the Southern Living Garden and a lunch uh, at the Garden Cafe at 1115. So if you're interested, please sign up in the church office. The cost of the lunch will be uh, 10 to $14 Dutch treat. So we're glad to have you uh, do that. Uh, we also want to extend sympathy to Angela uh, Sprayberry for the loss of her mother. Joyce Bowling, who passed away during the night, Friday night. So we, we want to uh, send our deepest condolences to that. Memorial service for Mary Nash tomorrow at 11 a.m. here at our church. Uh, Mary's a beloved member of our church, longtime member along with her husband Nelson, and we miss them greatly. And then great thanks to Mr. Hugh Pemberton. Uh, I know that you had to notice that beautiful arrangement in the front as you came in. Uh, once again, he created this beautiful Easter arrangement for the cross in the vestibule. Every year is better than the year before. Now, please join me. Thank you, Hugh, and join me for this brief video. When I tell people I'm a missionary, I get all kinds of questions. People ask, what kind of missionary are you? Or they want to know exactly what it is a missionary does. Or a lot of times you'll hear people say, a missionary here? You mean that's a thing? Well, there's 281 billion lost people in the U.S. and Canada. So, yeah, it's a thing. 
But there's one question no one ever asked me, and I wish they would. No one ever asked me to read the finish line. That's the question I want to hear. What does mission accomplish look like? You can watch videos about North American missionaries like me. You can read stories about us, you can pray for us. But don't get so caught up in the methods and minutia of what we do that you miss the main thing. Everything you see and hear and read about us is really just a means to an end. We start churches to make Jesus known. We meet needs to make Jesus known. We move to unfamiliar places, we meet unreached people, and we attempt unrealistic things just to make Jesus known. There is nothing more important than that. Nada. Nothing at all. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And so that's what Osage line looks like. It looks like obedience, same as your finish line. God speak, you give, we go. Everything starts with your head, so the any I'm strong is the offering. Those gifts enable us to go places where the gospel has never been. This is where we cross our finish line. This is where, together, we make Jesus known. And the Annie Armstrong Easter offering is the offering that Southern Baptists receive every year to support the work of the North American Mission Board. It provides about uh, half of the budget for the North American Mission Board throughout the year. And today we have set a goal of $17,000. And in just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to receive our offering. So I encourage you, if you would, come. And as we give sacrificially, we undergird what God is doing throughout North America. So let's stand together and let's receive our offering. <coughs> Now let's take a moment and ask God to bless these offerings. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the work of our North American Mission Board, missionaries, church planters, folks who are serving you in big cities and small places. We ask you, Lord, to bless the work that they're doing, and Father, to bless this offering and the offerings of Baptists all around the country as together we meet the needs of our North American Mission Board. Lord, bless uh, the work that's being done the witness that's being given, the lives that are being changed. And we pray, Lord, use it all to bring glory to Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Would you remain standing as we enter the uh, time for you to participate in the worship this morning and sing with us this great hymn. The handbells are going to accompany us on one more song today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Let's sing. <laughs>
way that Christians have greeted one another throughout the history of the church on this particular day, when together we say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And he is, and I'm so glad we're gathered together this morning to worship on Easter Sunday, to remember the resurrection of our Savior. The thing that matters most about everything we believe as Christians. And I'm glad you're here. Glad to have uh, members who are here with us, guests who have come, family who have returned. We're just glad you're here this morning. And we want to take a moment and greet one another and let folks know how glad we are to be in worship together. seated and I want to invite the kids to come up and join me up here on our our stage. How are y'all doing this morning? Good? Everybody doing well? Remember what Dr. Cooley said a moment ago on Easter? One of the things that we do is we say he is risen and how do we respond? He is risen indeed. That is right. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But I wanted to start talking to you this morning about something that I think all of you can appreciate. We have these for our congregation also to see. But we're going to talk about this right here. What is that? Symbols. Symbols. That's right. We're going to talk about symbols this morning. But not these symbols. We're going to talk about a different kind of symbol. And I'm going to see if you can tell me. Who is that? Batman. 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 That's right. When I see Batman, you know what I think of? I think of da 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 There you go. All right. I want to know if you were in the 70s or if you're in the new Batman. All right. Here we go. What is that? Hello Kitty. Hello Kitty. Now, how do you know that? There's nothing written there, but you just... It's a kitty and you just want to say hello. All right. Apple. Apple. Like an apple you eat? No. Um, like apple a brand. Phones. Apple phones. Apple now you won't know this one at all. 
Yeah. yeah, we got the mouse and we got the, what is that? Castle. Castle. Okay, last one. You ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. McDonald's! <laughs> McDonald's. Is that where, is that where you're going to go for lunch today? Well, no. No? no not McDonald's? It's not called McDonald's. It's, it's called McDee's. McDee's. That's right. Now, you did really well. Let's see if you can do well on this second one because, you know, in the church, we also have a lot of symbols that remind us of things. Like McDonald's reminds us of food. Apple's remind us of computers. Batman reminds us of Batman, right? So let's see. What do we have here in the church that reminds us of things in our Christian faith? What about this? What does that remind us of? Jesus died on the cross. And why did Jesus die on the cross? To save our sins. To save us from our sins. What about this one? Yeah, that's right. That's right up there, isn't it? And it reminds us that Jesus holds us in his arms. He's a good shepherd, that he protects us, right? Okay, ready? Here we go. Got two more. Actually, got three more. A dove. A dove. A dove. Do you know this is also a window in our church? Yeah. Where is that? Yeah, where is that thing? Dr. Cooley actually talked about this back during the pandemic when we did those daily encouragements. And people were looking all over the church for this window. But it is in the church. Now, what does the dove remind us of? Um, hmm. When Jesus flooded the earth. Oh, that's right. They, when there was a flood and they let the dove go out, right, to see if the earth was no longer flooded. Very good. And in the New Testament, the dove reminds us of the coming of the Holy Spirit, right, into our lives. All right, ready? How about this one? Lighthouse. A lighthouse. And sometimes we use this to talk about that Jesus is the, the, light the, the light of the world. All right, now this is the really hard one, and this is the one I'm going to talk to you about a little bit this morning. Butterfly. Butterfly. Monarch. monarch. A monarch, yes, specifically a monarch butterfly. That is correct. He made us new. He made us new. That's right, Tyler. That's right. You know, in the early church, they used the butterfly as a symbol of new life. It was also a symbol of what happened with Jesus, right? You remember? All right, look at this verse that we have up here. This is what this verse says. This verse says, He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. When we think about the butterfly, when the early church talked about the butterfly, it talked about something that we call the metamorphosis. And this is what I wanted to show you this morning. See, I have here, what is that? A caterpillar. Yeah, fortunately, caterpillars don't really look like that. That would be really scary. Yeah. <laughs> it's a free, it is freaky, isn't it? Yeah. So we got this caterpillar. Now, what happens with a caterpillar? Do you, have you seen caterpillars? That's right. He just eats and eats and eats and eats and gets fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter. And then eventually what happens is he becomes a chrysalis, right? And the chrysalis, and you know, the early church looked at this and they said, this is just like what happened to Jesus. That Jesus, when he went to the cross and they put him in the tomb, what did they think? They put him in the tomb. They thought, they thought that's it. Dead forever. He's gone. But what happens to the butterfly? That caterpillar eventually opens up and he becomes this butterfly and it says he is risen. And I love this butterfly because this butterfly actually has wings that work. Because there's something else and Tyler said it at the very beginning. The butterfly reminds us that we also have new life. Romans says, because he is risen, that we are justified through his resurrection. That means that our sins are forgiven because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And we have new life, right? Now, you know something interesting about the butterfly? Have you ever watched a butterfly? Yes. What do they do? What do they do? They, that's right. They do pollinate and then die. Right. So, <laughs> the, the part we're focusing on right now, though, is that they'll go from like flower to flower, Right. And do you know that butterflies also tell other butterflies where flowers are? They communicate yeah. with each other. Yeah. They do it with their wings, as a matter of fact. That's how, they, that's how they do that. You look skeptical. Go Google it. 
It's true. That's where I get all my information from. So the butterflies will go and they'll go to the flowers, right? And then once they find the flowers, they'll go and they'll tell the other butterflies, hey, some really good flowers over here. And so it's interesting because when the Bible says the angel talked to the people at the tomb, he said to the women, he said, he's not here, he's risen. But then he tells them to do two things. What did he tell them to do? He said, come and see, right? He said, come on and look and see. Jesus really isn't here. He really has risen from the dead. And so we come here this morning and, you know, we celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ isn't on the cross, that he has actually risen from the dead. But what do we do after that? What did he say? Go quickly and tell his disciples. So we're kind of like those butterflies. We come, we see, and then what do we do? We go and we tell others the good news that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. So this morning, as a reminder of what Jesus did for us as we give our lives to him, right? I want you to take a butterfly with you, all right? And I want you to share this story with somebody today about how Jesus Christ came, died on the cross, and just like this butterfly, everybody thought, oh, he's dead. But then after three days, what happened? He rose again. again. And because of that, we have new life, and we're supposed to do what? Go and tell others about Jesus. Now, Miss Susan, right over here, has some crayons if you want to color that like I colored mine, all right? So we'll pray, and then you'll grab the colors, and we'll go back to your seats, all right? Let's pray together. And if you want to go back to your seats like butterflies, you're certainly welcome to do that. Okay. Father, thank you so much for the new life that you give us through Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to be faithful, not only to come and see, but to go and tell what Jesus has done for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming down this morning. The choir is going to share some special music in the next few minutes, but we're going to do a medley of hymns, of Easter hymns, one of whom we've already done this morning, which we've done. But you remain seated, but if you come across a song you know, you be feel free to sing along with us on that song, okay?
I hear a song echo through the ages. The redeemed lifting up their praises to the one who from the earth's foundation looked upon a guilty world in love. I see the gift to the beggars given. Manger King held by highest heaven. Gentle Lamb, born to bring redemption, child of glory lying in the I want to invite our deacons to come forward this morning. Um, I also want to invite you all to stand with me this morning as we read God's word together.
This morning's scripture comes from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices, that they might come and win him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb, and the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, We will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this week and today especially. God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. God, we thank you that we have been born again into a living hope through that resurrection. And God, may we rejoice in that. We, um, we understand that that hope will never put us to shame. Through your son, God, we have mercy, forgiveness, and grace, God. And we praise you for that this morning. God, as we continue in our worship, as the word is preached today, God, as we um, give this offering, God, may you use it to glorify your name and advance your kingdom. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, some of you have come here with hurts and pains and disappointments, with joy, seeking Jesus. You've come here because of... uh, the church, but you've brought with you all the things in your life that God has given you that he can take and heal and comfort if we only speak the name of Jesus. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore God has also highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name
Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my Speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name.
We have truly been blessed by our seasons of worship this year for Easter time. Our choir did such a great job. Our handbells did such a great job. Our orchestra did such a great job this morning leading us in Easter worship. Jeff, thank you so much for your investment. And I know how much time you all have put into preparing for this morning. And we are so grateful for what you've done. And we had such a great time Friday night when our handbells uh, led us in a worship season preparing for the death of Christ. And I encourage you, if you missed that service or if you're on the Internet right now watching our service, you make sure that you go to our website and you prepare to be blessed. It's been a great time. I'm so grateful for the worship ministry of First Baptist Church. The year was 1932, and Pastor Alfred Ackley was preparing to preach to his California congregation. He was determined to be at his best. After all, this was Easter Sunday, and you know there are going to be people there on Easter that you don't see all of the time. And there might even be people there who need to hear the gospel and need to respond to the message of a risen Jesus. As he was getting ready... Back in 1932, he turned on his radio and he was listening as the service for a church in New York City began and as a nationally known pastor began to preach his own Easter sermon. And this is what he heard that pastor say. He said, good morning, it's Easter Sunday. This is one of those Sundays when people debate what really happened on that first Easter day. Some people say that it, there was no physical resurrection of Christ. You know, people, it doesn't really make any difference to me whether Jesus was literally risen or not. As far as I'm concerned, his body could be dust in some lost Palestinian tomb. You see, it was not the man that mattered. It was the message. When he heard that, all that Ackley could think to say was, that's a lie. It's just not true. If Jesus had not risen, then the four Gospels were wrong. There was no eternal hope for any soul. Unless Jesus truly rose from the dead, we have no reason to hope today. Later on that afternoon, after he had gone to his own church, after he proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus, Ackley sat down in his study and he read the story of the resurrection found in the Gospel of Mark. It's the same story we read together just a few moments ago. Inspired, he took out a piece of paper and he began to pen the words that would soon become a hymn. And it's a hymn that the church continues to sing almost a hundred years later. This is what Alfred Ackley wrote. He wrote, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. The Apostle Paul would agree with Alfred Ackley. In his day, just like in ours today, there were people who said they believed in what Jesus taught. They believed in what Jesus stood for. But they declared, I just cannot believe that anyone can rise from the dead. These people surrounding Paul wanted to claim a faith without a resurrection. And Paul could not let that lie stand. And so in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul boldly declared, you cannot have a living faith without an Easter hope. Listen to what the Bible declares in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. 
For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. Paul said it's important that we recognize your faith is useless unless there's a living Savior. Paul believed that. Ackley believed that. And I believe it as well. I believe that if there is no risen Savior, then all we're doing this morning is sitting in a room wasting our time because there's no other reason reason we should be here there's no reason our choir should have blessed us a few moments ago there's no reason we should ever gather in a church to worship an idea and not a savior that's why it's so important for you to know that what Paul declared so boldly is true today so let's talk about what we need to know if Christ is not risen Paul would say this, if Christ is not risen, then we have no one to trust. The Bible says if Jesus didn't conquer the grave, then nothing else really matters. We don't have a message. We don't have a reason for hope. We don't have anyone that we can trust. After all, it doesn't matter if you say that you believe in Jesus. If the Jesus you believe in died 2,000 years ago and he continues to be lost to history today. The message without the man our only words. This is what we need to remember this morning. If, in this li- if uh, Christ's life ended on the cross, then death wins. And nothing else matters. If everything that we know about Jesus Christ, everything that's contained in the Gospels, everything that the New Testament declares, everything that the church has always believed, If all of those things are based on a Jesus who died and remained dead, then none of it really matters. If he never left that Judean uh, tomb, then what you think about him really isn't all that important. He's just one more name lost in the dusty pages of history. Jesus of Nazareth is no different from every other religious figure lost people embrace. Because a Christ who died and never rose again cannot offer eternal life or eternal hope. Unless your faith is built on a risen Savior, you have no one you can trust when it matters the most. If Christ is not risen, then you can't say, I believe in Jesus, I trust Jesus, I follow Jesus, because you're talking about somebody who lived a long time ago And when his life ended, it was done. It's just not enough to say, I believe that he lived, and I believe that he died. In fact, Paul continues on, and he says this, If Christ is not risen, then there's nothing worth believing. Without a risen Jesus, it doesn't matter what you believe about anything. Paul said it clearly. He said, We are found false witnesses of God because we testified of God that he raised up Christ, if indeed the dead do not rise. It's very simple. Take away the resurrection, and the Christian faith collapses. Take away the resurrection and nothing we believe is important at all. There's nothing worth believing about Jesus if what the Bible teaches about the resurrection is a lie. People claim they can believe Jesus was a good moral teacher. After all, he had great parables that he taught and he gave good lessons about living. And after all, has anybody been the kind of teacher that Jesus was? The problem is Jesus never claimed to be a moral teacher. He declared he was the Savior. Some could say he was one of the greatest men who ever lived, but Jesus called himself the Son of God, the perfect sacrifice. They can say he only pointed the way to heaven, but Jesus is the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by 
me. Jesus is the one who said he would lay down his life, but he also said, and I will take it up again. Because he did. If the Bible lied about Jesus, and if Jesus lied about himself, it would be wiser to believe in nothing at all if Christ is not risen. But Paul continued on. He said this, and if Christ is not risen, then you are unforgiven. He said it clearly. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Nothing has happened that could ever wipe away the iniquity of your life and your soul. Not one thing has removed an iota of sin from your life if Christ is not risen. Even if there were a heaven, a place where all the good people go when they die, that would mean nothing to you and me because apart from Christ, you and I are not good people. In fact, Nobody is. Remember what Romans 3.23 says? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us has let him down. Every one of us has failed. Every one of us has committed sin, iniquity, trespasses, and all of the other ways that the Bible uses to describe people who have rebelled against God. And every time we rebelled against God, that sin, that stain removed us further away from ever having any hope of eternal life. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but without a risen Savior, you don't have a snowball's chance of getting into heaven on your own. It's just not going to happen. You have no hope of forgiveness if Christ is not risen. You're chained to your sins. They're dragging you down. What does Corinthians say? It says, your faith is futile, useless, unnecessary. If Christ is not risen, Paul says, then everything is hopeless. The Bible states it clearly, without the resurrection, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And that word translated perished means more than just death. It is a much stronger term. What it actually says is those who have fallen asleep in Christ have been pulverized, reduced to dust, atomized, completely annihilated. If there is no resurrection. In other words, life without a risen Savior is absolutely hopeless. I think about that kind of futility every time I hear somebody on television responding to some crisis or tragedy or heartache that someone is going through. And they always say something along these lines. So let's just think some positive thoughts for them. And I think, what good is that? What difference does it make? Either you have a reason for hope or you do not. Either Christ is all you depend upon or you perish. No wonder Paul wrote, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. The Bible says it clearly. If Christ is not risen, we have no one to trust, nothing to believe, no possibility of forgiveness, no hope of heaven. In other words, if Christ is not risen, we have nothing. We are most pitiable in all of the world. That would be true, except for that word. The biggest little word in the world. The word that means everything this Easter Sunday. And what is that little word? B-U-T. But. But now Christ is risen from the dead. All of those things would be true. But we would be without hope. But death would win in the end. But Christ is risen from the dead. 
And today we celebrate the fact that we truly do serve a risen Savior. The stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. Jesus rose again. He is the living Savior. He has, he has claimed victory over death, hell, and the grave. He has opened the door to eternal life. Every promise God gave us has been fulfilled by the living, risen Lord. The testimony of Scripture is simple and easy to believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And on this Easter Sunday, we recognize the fact that we celebrate a living Lord, that we are John 3, 16 believers, because that's the truth. And Jesus is the one who died and rose, that you and I might have everlasting life and that's why it's my great privilege to declare to you this day that Jesus is risen that he has opened the door to eternal life and all you have to do is trust him if I believe anything this Easter I believe with all of my heart it is this we serve a living Savior he lives he lives. And so can you if you place your trust in Jesus. Today I wonder if that's what you need to do in your own life. Is today the day when you need to surrender your life to Jesus? To recognize that it's not just important what he said and it's not just important what he did. It's not even most important how he died. What is most important is he rose again. He destroyed death. And he opened the door for everlasting life to anyone and everyone who will place their personal faith in him. And maybe today that's you. And maybe today is the day when you need to trust Jesus as your Savior. I can't think of a better thing to do on Easter Sunday than give your heart to Jesus. Or maybe today God is calling you to be part of what he's doing in this church, a church that celebrates the risen Savior, a church that believes everything the Bible tells us is true. And maybe you need to be part of that kind of church. Maybe there's a decision you need to make because of what the Lord is doing in your own life. Just a moment, we're going to stand, we're going to sing an invitation hymn. As God speaks to your heart, this is your day. You come, trust him today. Let's stand together. Let's sing. be seated again just for a moment 
James, you come up here and stand with me. Today is a wonderful time. Turn around and look at these folks, James. <laughs> Today is a wonderful day in James's life. A few weeks ago, I had one of those wonderful experiences that I love to have where what I do is just the period at the end of the sentence because James was talking to his mom and dad, his family, about giving his life to Jesus. He thought about what Jesus did for him on the cross and how much he wanted to trust him as Savior. And today he comes making his profession of faith in Jesus and ready to follow him in baptism and then live for him for the rest of his life. And this is really exciting because the family got to be part of this. Luke got to help him as he prayed his prayer. He waited for Jack to get home so he could be here for Easter Sunday. And today he comes to let you know Jesus is the Savior of your life, isn't he, James? And you've trusted him, and you're going to live for him. If you want James to know how excited you are about this decision, you say amen. amen. James, that's the whole church saying that they're excited about what Jesus has done in your life, and they're ready to help you as you grow in Christ. I'm going to ask his mom and dad to come and stand with him. And in just a moment, they're going to help him to go out into the lobby, and you'll be able to come by and just let him know how glad you are that on this Easter Sunday, he took his stand for Jesus, and he's going to live for him. And we're so excited about that. All right, let's stand together again. David and Jennifer, y'all go with James. Y'all go ahead and go out to the lobby. And let's pray together, and after that, one final song. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for what you've done in James's life. Lord, thank you that he trusted Jesus as Savior. Lord, thank you that the first people he thought about turning to to trust Christ were his parents and his family. And Father, we're so grateful for that. And Father, so grateful to be his church family. We've watched him from the day he was born. And we continue to watch him as Jesus does his work in James's life. And we thank you, Lord, for this Easter celebration. We thank you, Father, for the privilege we've had of worshiping together. But more than that, to recognize Christ is risen from the dead. And that makes all of the difference. So bless us, Lord, as we go from here to bear witness to the one who saved us and loved us and has given us eternal life. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.